Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Media Life here on TV3. My name is Pa Kwisiasari, and coming up in the next 60 minutes, moving in, in and out of Ghana's borders with Burkina Faso over the past four months, the Salafi jihadist militants on February 15th this year killed four Burkina B customs officers at a checkpoint uh, at Noho near the Ghana border and bent three vehicles. They also killed a Spanish priest. Now, jihadists also launched an attack on a church in Burkina Faso on April 29 this year after gunmen opened fire inside the protest uh, church. Uh, uh, killing six, the pastor, two of the sons, and three other worshippers. Now, Burkina Faso has been battling with jihadist groups since 2015. All right, so we're trying to, uh, we're going to try to understand exactly what's happening uh, here. Uh, we're going to engage Imano Kutin, who's executive director of the Africa Center for Security and Counterterrorism. Just joining me in the studio, uh, Mr. Kutin, thank you very much for your time. So I'm sure you've been monitoring the situation in Burkina Faso and other parts of the African continent. Uh, what, what's your own understanding of what's happening? Well, thank you for having me, and very good afternoon to your cherished viewers. In fact, the situation is not a good one at all. If you look at what has happened over the period, especially from Mali down to Burkina Faso, and the repressive nature of our democratic institutions in Benin, and just recently in Togo, I think we need to be getting ready to um, uh, forestall some of these things. As a country, we are not immune from terrorist attack and it's only appropriate that if your friends bears on fire you get water beside your own and what's the motivation for a lot of these actions especially in the church you, you see the, the Salafi group you mentioned you see because their spaces were getting shrink in the Islamic Maghreb because of the activities of the French troops and the African troops as well they began to look for ungoverned spaces. And you remember after the overthrow of uh, 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 Kampori, the military upheavals that came, it provided a very potential grounds for them to feed in, and they took charge. And if you look at Ghana in particular, given the political climate, it's not helpful. It looks as if we are losing our alliance to the state and we've reduced it to both the NDC and the MPP. If it happens like that, we are potentially creating ungoverned spaces for these terrorist organizations. That is why even today we came out with a press release with regards to the cage of arms that were uh, uh, clear at the port, a whistleblower, a good citizen for that matter, prompted security agencies. So the question is that what needs assessments? Has the Minister of Interior done to warrant the granting of license to a civilian to bring a 40 footer cage of arms for civilian use? Granted, that even if these arms were for game, as we, uh, uh, they are alleging, do we have side game reserves in this country? Mm. Is it a subculture within us? So I think that we should not look at individual profits at the expense of state security. Mm. And also, we have a lot of illegal arms in the system we are trying to stem. So to be honest, I also appeal to the state agencies. If they can confiscate these weapons mm. and then compensate the importer because he has not done anything mm. illegal he right. was duly i'm, I'm going to come back to you shortly uh, so we're looking at the uh, recent incessant attacks by uh, jihadist groups uh, in churches and uh, the, the very uh, recent case is that of burkina faso where uh, several people were killed in churches uh, my, my guest is a security analyst Emmanuel kutin um, let's get on the phone lines now and speak to reverend professor paul from paul manso he's the president of the ghana Con Con pentecostal and charismatic council uh, thank you very much sir for your time now in the wake of attack on churches in uh, neighboring Burkina Faso. What measures are being taken uh, by your constituency to ensure that we do not record such cases here in Ghana? I'm afraid we've lost uh, Professor Frimpong Marcel on the phone lines. We'll try and reestablish co uh, contacts with him. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Kutin, what should we begin to do here in Ghana? I think the churches should take their own destiny into their own hands. If we want to rely on the state security, we can only react instead of uh, preventing. Mm. There should be visibility as well. I think 
the cooperation between the churches and our national security intelligence to be up now. If it's even possible to train some of the church security, mm -hmm. it's important. We need to also make use of technology, the scanners, and get CCTV in a particular, uh, in a particular radios and get a control room such that the people can monitor whatever is happening ar ar along the church premises 24-7. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be only church Kindly hold on for me. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll be on. I think this is a security issue that goes beyond the church. Nevertheless, the church has to do something. My take is that, and I'm actually working on the data, the various councils that, like the GPCC, the charismatic churches, uh, the Catholic, the Christian Council, we can hold a joint meeting and possibly meet the national security and work out together to get the things resolved. In the meantime, my advice is that all the churches should take it as a matter of prayer because our security comes from the Lord. The word of God is unless the Lord builds the house, the labor is free, that builds it. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman wakes up but in prayer. Nevertheless, we need to educate our people, especially when a strange person comes into our mix or when we see somebody of a different behavior. We should also try not to aggravate things by fighting against them. This is not a time to speak against anybody or any religion. I can tell you that in Ghana, we have a very good relationship with the Muslims, and you can see. And even when I call Burkina, the Muslims are also affected, and they are also disturbed about what is happening. So we should not do anything to heighten religious tension. But we should rather calm down. People have asked me, do we need scandals and the rest? And I said that for serious security advice, I will leave it with the national security. But for now, we should be calm. We should not create any panic or tension. But we should also be proactive if there is any security lessons that should be taught about to our church members or any form of preparation or advice. We should do it. I'm also worried because how can people even feel safe and pure and pray in churches? People go to church to find peace and shelter. Now, the churches have become the place of death trap where people go and get killed. So uh, it's really something, and I will encourage the media and everyone to advise Christians how we behave in the middle of this. But for now, Christians should speak up and pray to God as we, the leaders, collaborate together. It is not one church matter. Last week, they, last week, they killed a family of God people. They have killed Catholics. They see the last they killed Catholics and a family of God people. In Ghana, it can be anybody. And we should not take this for granted or say that it is just a wolf, wolf shouting. We should really be proactive and work together, but I'm pleading of the lesser security and people who are on top of security affairs to be able to help us overcome this crisis. All Should right. Oh, okay, sir. Thank you very much sir, for your time. Reverend Professor Frim Paul Man, so, uh, you know, sharing his thoughts there on the recent insecurity um, within the church. Uh, you want to quickly wrap up for us? Yes, I think as a country, we shouldn't, there, there shouldn't be any cause for alarm in a way. That is not to say we are immune. I think we just have to be proactive and take uh, uh, security measures and be conscious. And like the point I was making, there was one light bit I didn't do. Like the churches should make sure that they have a condom where bags or backpacks can be kept and not brought to the main churches. If you observe the Indonesian situation, the, the guy who actually detonated the bomb mm. carried the bag mm. into the church. And I think in as much as we want to welcome everybody into the church... Is there really a way to curtail care. these kinds of uh, suicide attacks? I mean, these are people who don't, don't mind, you know, losing their lives. You see, it's a battle of, uh, of ideology. And it goes beyond the human psyche. Mm. Sometimes if you see the kind of people even involved in suicide bombing, they are what to do and from very wealthy backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So I think that it is not 
just simple as we see it. Mm. There are no short-term solutions Absolutely. to it. It's some, some of long-term solutions Absolutely. we have to look at. Some Thank you very much, uh, Imano Kutin is a security analyst helping us to understand the recent incessant attacks on churches in Burkina Faso. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your time. You also watch Media Life here on TV3. To other news now, the Women Wing of the National Democratic Congress says it will, in the next seven days, collect signatures to force the Criminal Investigations Department boss, uh, COP Mami Yatewa Adedankwa, to resign if she does not produce the three Takwadi kidnapped girls. At a news conference in Accra, the Women's Organizer of the Party, Dr. Hannah Bissil, also called on the police service and the Attorney General to bring to book perpetrators of the violence during the Yawa so West Wagon by elections. Uh, my colleague Godfrey Tanam was at the presser and reports. The women wing of the National Democratic Congress NDC took advantage of the Mother's Day celebration to express their frustration over what they described as a weak leadership and insensitive posturing of President Ekofo Adu towards the security situation in the country. This they say has emboldened criminals and increased impunity in the country. What has become the norm today is the state to rather back criminal elements in their actions, whilst trying desperately to quell and suppress critical voices of dissent, including the media. The National Women Organizer of the main opposition NDC, Dr. Hannah Bissou, touching on the three Takrade kidnapped girls, expressed disappointment over the inability of the security services to find or have any sufficient intelligence on the whereabouts of the girls. It is our hope and belief that this year's celebration of motherhood would be a moment of sober reflection for President Okufuado, the CID boss, the Minister for Gender, Children and Social Protection, on the urgent need for them to find the missing girls and reunite them with their grieving mothers and families. On the death of the investigative journalist Ahmed Swali, Dr. Hannah Bissou was surprised why a central member of parliament, Kennedy Japan, is not standing trial over his pronouncement leading to the tragedy. The killers of Ahmed Swali and all who played a role in his murder, especially Honorable Kennedy Japan, be arrested and brought to book. She called for the head of the CID boss if the girls are not found. The National Women's Wing of the NDC will be collecting signatures in the next seven days for a petition demanding for the CID boss, Tiwa Adodankwa, to produce the three kidnapped Takrade girls in the next 14 days or resign from office. The NDC National Women's Organizer added the failure of the government to publish their mill short commission report and act decisively on their findings has not helped the situation. Family members of Ahmed Swali, the Takwadi kidnapped girls, and victims of the Ayawasu West Wagon by election were present at the news conference. To other news, the annual ban on drumming and noise making within the jurisdiction of the Ga and Ingleshi Alata Traditional Council in the Greater Accra region takes effect from today, Monday, May 13. It will span a period of one month ending on Thursday, June 13. A press release signed by the Head of Public Affairs for the Accra Metropolitan Assembly, Gilbert Ni Ankra, urged all villages and towns under the Ga and Ingleshi Alata Traditional Council to comply with the ban. Uh, let's speak with uh, Numo Blafo III. Uh, he's a Ga. Blafo Wulomo uh, joins us on the uh, joins us live in the studio. Thank you, sir, for your time. So, what's the essence of this ban? Um, thank you. Um, you see, actually, that's the time for we, the chief priests, and then the chiefs. You are chief priest. Yes. Mm. To go into our holy places. Holy places. Yes. To ask for blessings, guidance, because you know, this is the time to farmers actually are preparing for. They are farming activities like planting before harvesting. Mm -hmm. And this is the time to fishermen are also readying themselves for the bumper fish harvest. Right. So this is the time we go pray for 
bumper harvest of fish, we pray for food, we pray for blessing, and everything that is good for humanity. Mm, we have this happen annually, every year there's yeah. a ban on noise making and drumming. Do you have this um, obeyed throughout the season? Yes, generally I would say um, people tend to obey, but we only have a few isolated cases, isolated cases mm. which normally comes about I mean, once in a while. Mm. So which specific areas in Accra, you know, are affected? Um, we're looking at Gamashi and there are villages under them. And when we're talking about Gamashi, we have Nglesha Alata. It has villages like Amamfru, Nglesha Amamfru, but parts of Bat Batiano and all those places. And then you come to Akangaji. Akangaji is also another division Actually, now, English Alata is a paramountcy, but Akamaji is a division within the Gamashi or the Ga traditional area. Then Sempe and their villages, then you have Asene, Besi, Abola, and Otublohu, and all the villages and towns under these divisions. And then it will also affect Osu, but Osu people's own will begin on Friday. Okay. Yeah. So often during this time, what's the uh, collaboration with churches? Um, we normally have meetings with them at the RCC. In fact, the RCC, the that's Coordinating the Regional Council. Coordinating Council, mm. calls the Christian Council and all the other uh, religious bodies. We meet and then we all put um, forward our propositions. We discuss and then agree on modalities as to how we will or we should go about it, not forgetting what the established norm is. Mm which is that we don't want any noise. We have in the past head of cases where uh, people from the God Traditional Council will enter churches, seize uh, their equipment, go into chop bars, you know, take out bowls and food. <laughs> I mean, is that the way to go? Um, I think there are some of the issues that come up which are actually exaggerated because you can't say if someone is eating, that person is making noise, you understand? Mm. But when our task force, and you see, there is this task force that is always set by the AMA. We have members of the AMA um, guards, and then we have people also drawn from the traditional council, and then the police who normally go out mm. to check or to enforce this uh, ban. Mm. So sometimes too, in areas where maybe they are not there, the chiefs in those areas also have their youth groups who right. also go out to enforce this ban. Now, some churches actually don't want to abide by the rules. Therefore, when you are playing your drums and all, and the people come, they will enter your church. There are instances where some of these churches have hired people to guide them so that they can flout the law. Mm. And in some cases, policemen. Mm. Because I've had the opportunity of being called to a place where there was this police inspector guiding the people who were playing drums to, in, to flower during, traditional laws. Yes, mm. during that period, mm. you see. So these are the issues. Now, last year, for example, we had this issue at Abeka where because there is a member of the church who is a police officer, mm. so he decided to take the law into his own hands when there is the ban in place. Our people entered and they started beating them. At the end, they rather called the Tessano police to come and arrest our people. Mm -hmm. you, you, you get me? And these right. are the kind of issues that right. we, we are normally confronted with. Right. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Numo uh, Blafo the third. Uh, helping us to uh, understand some issues uh, happening within the Ghana Traditional Council. Thank you, sir, for your time. Uh, so the Supreme Court has deferred ruling on the selling of Alfred Woyome's properties to June 27, 2019. The court has offered no explanation for the decision to postpone the ruling, which was expected to be given on Monday, May 13. Supreme Court Justice Alfred Benning deferred ruling on the state's application seeking an order of the court to sell several properties he had identified as belonging to the embattled business and judgment debtor Alfred Agbeshi Wunyume. The properties are two executive buildings located at Rasaku in Accra, in the office complex of Anato Holdings, a company owned by Mr. Wunyume, two residential buildings in Caprice and Abelingpe 
both Sabeb Sinakra as well as Mining Quarry owned by Mr. Woyome in the Eastern Region. The state identified the properties owned by Mr. Woyome, which is estimated at 20 million cities, that it believes could prove vital in retrieving the 51.2 million cities judgment debt he received from the state unlawfully. However, defunct UT Bank claimed that some of the properties identified by the state are theirs. It was the claim of lawyers of the defunct UT Bank that Woyome used the said properties as collateral for loans at the bank which he failed to pay back. The ownership of the properties according to UT Bank based on the failure to pay back the loans transferred to the bank automatically. The state represented by Deputy Attorney General Godfrey Ebuadami had argued that there is no evidence to show that the said properties were used as collateral by Wyoming to secure loans from UT Bank. The properties the state maintained are owned by the embattled businessman and therefore prayed to the court to declare same as true to pave way for the state to sell them. The Apex Court was suspected to deliver its judgment on May 13th. However, after meeting with all the parties involved in the case in chambers, Enquiries by journalists revealed that judgment on the UT Bank side of the case, according to the judge, is ready, but that of the Anato Holdings is not ready. The presiding judge therefore instructed that the parties should return to court on June 27, 2019, for a joint decision. All right, so you're still watching Media Life here on TV3. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook. Uh, if you feel strongly about any of our top stories this hour, do not hesitate at all. You can uh, share your views and suggestions as well as comment with us. Visit our social media feed at TV3GH on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, this afternoon, the Center for Democratic uh, Development Ghana is holding a press conference on the Office of the Special Prosecutor. Uh, we're going to cross over live there to hear the board chairman of the Office of the Special Prosecutor, Linda ofori -Kwafu. on the accommodation of the OSP. I'm sure most of us here know where the OSP, OSP currently in principle. And as he rightly said, there are steps underway to get a bigger and a more appropriate place for him and the team. But then there's some formation going out around that. This new place is ready and that's the OSP has to move to. I'm not sure whether this new place is ready and the OSP has no moved to. From where I sit, I know work is still being done and the place is not ready for the OSP to move in. That said, in terms of staff of the office, the board has a responsibility to advise on the recruitment of some senior level officials. The four divisions, could you mention, are clearly stated in the act. The people who head these office can be considered senior level individuals. As I said, the second ally deals with human capital, and so all these matters have been addressed. And if today recruitment should start, there is a lay down procedure to be followed in getting the appropriate people to fill the office. Another issue I would want to comment on is the one about publications to be made by the OSP office. And I think that is provided for in Section 33 of the Act 959. Two main requirements are specified, and I'm also happy Dr. mentioned this. So there's a list going around that says these are the things the OSB is working on. <coughs> what I want us to do is to test whether this list meets the requirements as provided under the two provisions of Section 3. As could you mention, the first six months. So many things were happening, and ordinarily, there was no way such a publication could have come up. So we should study clearly. I don't have the acts before me, but it's quite specific 
on the issues that are supposed to be provided in the arts space. There are so many sub-sessions under the arts. So I know the expectations of Ghanaians to see some work being done. And I'm thinking Ghanaians are only waiting to see people go to jail. And that's quite unfortunate. I'm not speaking for the OSA, and I don't speak for that office. But I just want us to know that in as much as we all want corruption to be dealt with, and people investigated properly and sanctioned where the need arises, we should also make sure the office works according to the data procedures. So some work is being done. So it's quite unfortunate to let us out. But I'm not sure that's the list that even I got to know from the media. I heard it on radio. And I'm not required, and no board member is required to even know under the law. He does not have that obligation to be providing us with the details of the cases. He, that will mean amount to some court. All right, so you just heard the chairman of the Office of the Special Prosecutor, Linda Oforikwa, for there addressing the press. So watch your media live here on TV3 on our MTN Video Report this afternoon. Our citizen journalist, Enoch Achampon, reports about a pit at a trima in the Ashanti region and what authorities uh, want authorities to come to their aid. This is an area in Kumasi, a place called Achuma Techiman. There's a very big pit. Look at how the situation is like. It's very bad. It has even come near the road. Cars can't even pass. So we are pleading the government to take a look at this and then come and help the people around this area because it's very bad and it can kill people around here. And just like our citizen journalists, you can also send your video report via WhatsApp to 055-1433-044. That's 055-1433-044. We'll take a short break. We've got business news. Hi there, good afternoon and welcome to the business news segment here on Midday Live. The Roads and Highways Ministry has secured approval from the Public uh, Procurement Authority to initiate the private takeover of the management of toll booths across the country. The move is intended to ensure the efficient running of the booth for improved revenue generation. The toll booth is one of the four major revenue generation avenues for the state road fund. The contract period is expected to last three years. At the moment, there are 35 revenue earning toll booths in the country which will be 36 soon after the completion of a new one at Aplau. Robert Saba is the national vice president of the Ghana Private Road and Transport Union. Right, Robert Saba is with the Ghana Private Road Transport Union. He joins us on the phone lines. Robert, thank you for your time. So what's your reaction to the decision by government? Oh, well, uh, we don't have much problem about whoever in charge of the of the connection. If it is for efficiency, uh, yes, we will all support. But uh, if it comes to the point whereby uh, there will be an increment, that is where we have a cause to complain. Because uh, it will add on to our operational costs. And uh, when it happens like that, then it means we also have to review our, our, our fares. Uh, we pass it on to definitely to the, the passengers. So we don't have problem at all. But, but don't you think this has come too little too late, considering that um, we've had this in the hands of uh, government for a very long time, that the public, the private sector should have been manning this toll booth for a very long time? We don't have problem. I said we don't have problem. Not until there is an increment at the various toll booths. That is where, you know, our concern is. If there is no increment, yes, and uh, the, the, the price is just as it is. Uh, we will we'll pay as we are paying. Then uh, we will move on to do our daily uh, uh, duties, to perform our daily duties. We don't have a problem with 
Uh, all right. Please. Okay. All right, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. John Salah is with the Ghana Private Road Transport Union uh, telling us what he makes of government decision to begin to privatize the activities of toll booth uh, centers across the country. Now, Ghana has become the largest uh, producer, gold producer in Africa, toppling South Africa in recent data released by the World Bank. The data copied to the Ghana News Agency said Ghana exported 158 tons of gold in 2018. That's about 15% increase over the previous year. Ghana has dethroned South Africa, which produced 139.3 tons and returned to the high volumes of the 1980s. It said mining firms operating in the country include Newmont Mining Corporation, Goldfields, Anglo Gold Ashanti, and Asanko Gold. It noted rural communities in four regions of Ghana currently affected by the environmental damage and pollution associated with destructive artisanal mining and logging practices are to benefit from a scale up of the Ghana Forest Investment Program. The World Bank approved additional finance of $19.39 million to the program last week. The program is already implementing activities focusing on agricultural drivers of deforestation by working with cocoa farmers and communities to rehabilitate and protect forest reserves. The additional financing operation aims at complementing these activities by piloting approaches to and benefit of reclamation of mining sites, which will reduce erosion currently polluting public water courses and engage the private sector in plantation development to reduce pressure on natural forests. China tops the global pact, followed by Australia, Russia, and the United States of America. That's all for the news. Thanks to the producers, to the cameramen, and to the directors. For more news, you can log on to our website, www.3news.com. My name is Parkus Yasari. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.